The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. Now, for those of you who are just joining us in this discussion, this is lesson number 427 in the Life of Christ series. For the last 21 weeks, we've been looking at various aspects of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus said to the apostles, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And for the last nine weeks, we've been talking specifically about the Lord's command that his disciples are to be baptized, paying particular attention to the question of what baptism accomplishes in the way of salvation. And you all know very well that this is not a question which is posed in a vacuum. Because going back as far as the Apostle Paul and James, the brother of the Lord, there has been tension in the church in regard to the question of how salvation is to be received and how it is to be maintained. And this was at the heart of the controversy between Augustine and Pelagius in the 5th century and between the late John Calvin and Arminius in the 17th century. And it remains an issue of no small disagreement in the church today. And at the heart of this controversy stands baptism and the question of the role that baptism plays in one's salvation. Now, on one side of the debate stand those who argue that salvation is by grace through faith alone. And on the other side of the debate stand those who argue that salvation is by grace through faith born aloft in baptism. But the problem with both of those arguments is that they both depend on a skewed definition of salvation. Because salvation isn't just one thing. No, salvation is made up of at least two major components, justification and sanctification. Now, that I have known for as long as I can remember, that there's a difference between the two. And I've preached to you this many times. We have been justified, we are being sanctified. That isn't new information. What is new to me within the last decade or so is the understanding of how the difference between justification and sanctification ought to come to bear on any discussion of salvation and the degree to which that has not happened in our tradition and how that oversight has affected our understanding of salvation and our understanding of the function that baptism serves in salvation. So over the last couple of weeks, I've been setting the stage, laying the groundwork for us to discuss that, doing my best to demonstrate that in justification, the righteousness of God is imputed to us, but in sanctification, we become the righteousness of God through Christ. And those two processes together make up salvation. But the two are very different, because our sanctification is a reality in the making, but our justification is a de facto reality. Now, we don't generally have any real difficulty understanding reality in the making. I mean, suppose somebody asks you, have you moved into your new house yet? Ask you a simple, straightforward question, but the answer may not be simple and straightforward, because your answer might be, well, we signed the papers last week, I changed my address at the post office yesterday, I picked up the keys the day before yesterday, I changed my address on my driver's license today, I spent the night in the house last night, but the furniture doesn't arrive till tomorrow, and the wife and kids don't arrive till next week. So when does your house become a home? Is it when you get the keys? Is it when you hang your hat there? Is it when you eat there? Is it when you hang up your toothbrush there? Is it when your whole household arrives? You see, at the time of the question, have you moved in, you could have said yes at just about any point in that week and a half and have been giving it a truthful answer. And the person you were talking to would have understood your answer to be truthful, even though you were speaking only of a reality in the making. Now, we all understand that pretty well. But a de facto reality is another matter, because a de facto reality is a declared reality. For instance, suppose you have a relative who drops off her baby at your house and asks you to take care of him for a few days while she sorts some things out. But a few days come and go and you never hear from her again, she seems to fall off the face of the earth. Well, eventually, a day is going to come when you'll need to take the child to the doctor or enroll him in school, and you'll be asked to sign on the dotted line where it says, legal parent or guardian. 
Now, I don't know all the legal ins and outs of this, but I do know that in most states, as the de facto parent of this child, you probably won't place yourself in much legal jeopardy for signing as his parent. But let's take it a step further. Let's say that in the absence of the child's natural parent, you and your spouse decide to adopt this child. Now, once an order or judgment of adoption or a similar decree from a court is entered, one or both of the biological or natural parents becomes a legal stranger to the child, legally no longer related to the child and with no rights related to him or her. Conversely, the adoptive parents are legally considered to be the parents of the adopted child, and in many states, a new birth certificate reflecting that state of affairs will be issued. So, in every way that matters to most of us, this child is now your child, birth certificate and all. However, there's an interesting and kind of troubling legal term for such documents. Technically, an adoptive birth certificate is known in the legal world as a legal fiction because it testifies to a state of affairs which is acceptably true, but not completely true. Because this child, though legally, emotionally, spiritually, environmentally, and in every way that matters to most of us, is your child. Nevertheless, he is not, and will never become, flesh of your flesh, blood of your blood. His birth certificate says that he is, but that certificate is a legal fiction. And beloved, that is the same term that many theologians have historically used to refer to justification. Because justification in and of itself is not transformational, but positional and relational. Justification does not change us. It changes our standing with God. Changing us is the work of sanctification. In justification, we are declared righteous, even though we remain manifestly sinful. Justification does not produce a moral change in us. It does not turn us into good people. That is the work of sanctification. Justification does not regenerate us. It does not change us into new creatures. That is the work of sanctification. Justification does not convert us. It does not turn us toward God. That is the work of sanctification. In justification, our sins are pardoned, but they are not remitted. That is to say, in justification, we are counted sinless, but we are not made actually sinless. Never to sin again. This is the work of sanctification. And justification on its own is not a reality in the making. That is the description of sanctification. Rather, justification is a de facto reality, a declared reality, just as is an adoptive birth certificate. But there's a critical difference between a judicial fiat and a divine fiat. Because a judicial fiat does not have the power to change reality. But a divine fiat not only can change reality, but it must change reality. When God imputes his righteousness to us, that is not a legal fiction. Because make no mistake about it, those whom God has declared positionally righteous will in fact and indeed be made actually righteous. As Paul tells us in Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Because from God's perspective, the things that he declares have been done, have in fact, and indeed, been done. Some years ago, I don't remember exactly when, there were a number of articles in science magazines about mapping the universe. Because though it has been known since 1923 that the Milky Way is but one galaxy among many, it wasn't until the 1990s, with the deployment of the Hubble telescope, that we were able to see clearly very far beyond our galaxy. But since the mid-1990s, when they gave the Hubble corrective lenses, a lot of time and energy has gone into mapping the universe, into mapping the cosmos. And sometime thereafter, it was announced that a team of astrophysicists had found the edge of the observable universe. And when that happened, a number of science writers speculated that if we could just see past the edge of the cosmos, then perhaps we could see God. A proposition that I viewed with a jaundiced eye. Because on the face of it, the asking of that question would seem to at least give something of a nod to divine creation. That is, if those putting it forward were doing so in earnest. But we know that wasn't the case, because while those making the suggestion were indeed acknowledging the need for a first cause, they were confident that the first cause, whatever it might be, is not divine. 
So they were speaking very much tongue-in-cheek with this proposition, but that isn't what bothered me most about this proposition. No, what I found most irksome about this suggestion was that it derayed a fundamental mis misunderstanding about what God is, where God is, and when God is. In John 4, 19-24, in relaying to us the report of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, John tells us, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and even now has come, when all true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such worshipers to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now all my life, what I've been told that that means is that under the new covenant there are no holy places, because God is spirit and spirits have no substance, no extension in time or space. Therefore God being spirit isn't somewhere, he is everywhere. Well, beloved, that can't possibly be the right way to interpret this passage, because the Bible in other places tells us otherwise. According to the Bible, spirits are not immaterial, and God, who is spirit, is not immaterial. In Daniel 10, we find Daniel a prayer, and he's been a prayer for three weeks without a reply. Then, starting in verse 12, Daniel 10, the reply comes, and it is delivered personally by the archangel Gabriel. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was being detained there with the kings of Persia. But now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Now, this passage gives us rare and valuable insight into the inner workings of the spiritual realm, the inner workings of the realm of spiritual beings. And the picture it reveals is not one of a place or of beings that have no substance. Because what Gabriel tells Daniel reveals that angels in the spiritual realm that they occupy are substantive, and in a sense that corresponds almost directly with the sense in which we, and the realm that we occupy, are substantive. Daniel has been praying for 21 days. And Gabriel comes to him and says, From the first day that you began speaking, your prayer has been heard. And this indicates that Gabriel, as he went about his business in the spiritual realm, was aware of time and of the passage of time. And, according to what Gabriel says next, it sounds very much like he is experiencing the passage of time in very much the same way that Daniel is experiencing it. Because Gabriel reports that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days. Well, if the spiritual realm isn't substantive, what is 21 days? To Gabriel, why should he even be aware of the passage of time while he's fighting with the prince of Persia? If the spiritual realm is completely free of the strictures of time and space, then Daniel shouldn't have had to have waited at all for his answer, because no time should have been passing while whatever was happening in the spiritual world was happening. That is, if time is merely a construct, if time is an artificial template placed over the expanse of eternity for our benefit to accommodate for our limited capacity to grasp reality, as so many people say, and if, as so many insist, the spiritual realm is not subject to time. But, beloved, think about it. Because unless we assume either that Gabriel is deluded or that he is a co-conspirator with God in the ledger domain of time, and is deliberately feeding Daniel misinformation, then we probably ought to take Gabriel at his word here. And according to his report, he experienced the passage of those 21 days very much the same way that Daniel, in real time. Not only that, but Gabriel goes on to say that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help him, for he was being detained there with the king of Persia. The reason that Gabriel's answer to Daniel's prayer was delayed, according to the archangel, was because Gabriel was occupied for those 21 days. And he wasn't occupied just for a period of time, he was also occupied in a particular place. 
Daniel was somewhere, and Gabriel was somewhere else. Where? Well, we don't know exactly, but we do know that wherever it was, the Prince of Persia was there too. Now, most theologians understand this Prince of Persia to be some demonic spirit, an angel of Satan who is, in some sense, controlling the earthly ruler of Persia, and I think that that's probably right. And what Gabriel tells us about the Prince of Persia is that he is somewhere, and wherever that somewhere is, Gabriel had to be there in order to engage him. He couldn't do it from where Daniel was. He could not do battle with the Prince of Persia unless he was where the Prince of Persia was. As a matter of fact, he had to wait in that location until Michael came to his relief, because Michael also was somewhere else, somewhere other than where Gabriel and the Prince of Persia were. And Michael had to depart from wherever he was in order to go to wherever Gabriel was so that Gabriel could leave that location and go to wherever Daniel was. And that tag team effort took 21 days to accomplish. Now, beloved, I don't know how anybody can read that and conclude that spiritual things do not have substance. If Gabriel's report to Daniel and Daniel 10 is accurate, then it can only be that spiritual things do have substance. And it can only be that in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly places, time functions very much the same way as it does here. Now that is the testimony of Daniel 10, but it is also something that any of us could intuit on our own with two minutes thought. Because in the absence of time and space, there is no possibility of events. Nothing can occur where there is no time or no space. Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, most theologians say that time is part of creation, that time did not exist before God said, let there be. But friends, that's utter nonsense. Because while it may be possible that God could exist in the absence of time, there's no way that he could speak or do anything else under those conditions, not according to the Bible. Because Elihu tells us in Job 34, 14 through 15, that if God ever resolved to withdraw his spirit from the universe, beckoning the breath of life to return to him, then every living thing would die in an instant and humankind would return to dust. And John tells us in John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And from these passages, we know that when God said, let there be, that that was an event, not merely a thought or a notion. Because when he opened his mouth, the word that proceeded from his mouth was God the Son. And the word went forth, and it was so, for the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. Brothers and sisters, that's motion. If you are paying attention, even a little, in 10th grade science class, then you know that motion cannot occur in the absence of time and space. Now you may wonder what any of this has to do with today's lesson. Don't lose heart. I'm getting there. Elihu knows what he's talking about when he says that the breath of God inhabits the entire cosmos and sustains everything. And Jesus knows what he's talking about when he says in Matthew 6, 9, this then is how you should pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. Because Jesus knows that just as surely as the Spirit of God is present from one end of the cosmos to the other, the person of God isn't everywhere. The person of God is somewhere. Our Father, which art in heaven. Now, if you want to know where heaven is, you'll have to do your own research or wait for another lesson. The Bible tells us that information, and I plan to tell you that in a few weeks. But that's not my concern this morning. No, this morning my focus is elsewhere. Because the Bible doesn't just tell us that God is someone who is somewhere. It also tells us that he is some when. And yes, some when is a real word. I did not make that up. Now, make no mistake about it. Time is not God's master. But time is also not created. All the biblical evidence of which I'm aware suggests that time is eternal. And as such, it may actually be a component of God himself. Nevertheless, he is sovereign over time, at least to the degree that he is sovereign over himself. And it appears that he has the ability to move through time. But, and this is vitally important for this morning's lesson, it also appears from the testimony of Scripture that God abides in time. 
That is, just as he is someplace that he calls home, he also has time that he calls home. And that time isn't the past. That's the major shortcoming of the hypothesis I mentioned a few minutes ago, that if you could look past the edge of the cosmos, we would see God. Because the scientific community has all been unanimous that the farther we look toward the edge of the universe, the farther back in time we are looking. And that when we observe the horizon where the Big Bang supposedly occurred, we're looking at something that happened roughly 14 billion years ago. And that's where, to their minds, we ought to be able to find God, if there is a God. But, beloved, the notion that the place to find God is in the past runs counter to the testimony of Scripture. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you think the universe is. The principle is still the same. However long ago it was that God said, let there be. Anyone who thinks that that is the vantage point from which God is observing and managing his creation now fundamentally misunderstands what God is, where God is, and when God is. Because God is someone who is both somewhere and somewhere. And that somewhere isn't the past. The Bible tells us so. According to the Bible, God speaks of things that have not yet happened as though they have already happened, and God cannot lie. Now, just stop and let that sink in for a minute. According to Romans 4.17, God calleth those things which be not as though they were. And in Numbers 23.19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, not a child of Adam that he should change his mind. Has he ever spoken and then failed to act? Has he ever made a promise that he failed to fulfill? Now, if both of these statements are true, then whenever God says, this is so, then it can only be that from his perspective, it is so, even when, from our perspective, it is not yet so. So, for instance, using the example that Paul gives us in Romans 4.17, in Genesis 17.5, God said to Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. Now, that claim on God's part, from Abraham's perspective, had not yet been substantiated. It had not yet been realized. So, for Abraham to accept this statement as true required faith on his part faith of the type that Jesus speaks of in Mark 11:24, where he says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. But it does not require faith on God's part. For God to represent this statement as true, then it must be true from his perspective, and not provisionally true, not potentially true, not merely true in the context of his own confidence in himself, to make it come about, but manifestly true, accomplished, fact. Otherwise, the statement is false. Neither the fact that God has the power to make it so, nor the assurance that God will keep his word, make it so. Those are both contingencies. They do not make it actually so. The only thing that makes it so is doing what has been proffered. I mean, suppose when you were a child, your mother asked you, have you cleaned your room? And you were to answer, yes, I have, on the basis of your intention to do it when the times have reached their fulfillment. Well, what are you going to do when she goes to check to see if your room is in fact clean and finds that it is not? What are you going to say? Well, I speak of things that have not happened as though they have happened, because I'm trying to be more like God. Don't worry about the fact that it isn't done. Rest in the confidence that it will be done. After all, just as God has the power to bring to pass whatsoever he claims has been brought to pass, I too have the power to bring the cleaning of my room to pass, just as I claim I have already done. Now, how far do you think that would fly? And if I had ever said that to my mother, flight would be in evidence. <laughs> as I landed somewhere in the middle of next week. Because your mother knows that the power to bring your claim to pass does not, in fact, make the claim true in the present. Well, the same is so for God. In order for the claim that he makes in Genesis 17.5, I have made you the father of many nations to be true, it had to have been manifestly true for God when he said it. God cannot lie, so this statement must have been true. But how? In what sense? Well, when God came to Abraham in Genesis 17, he came to him from somewhere, and from somewhere. Now we all know the where, 
but most of us have never stopped to think about the when. What I'm telling you this morning is that according to the Bible, insofar as God operates within time, whenever he comes to us, he comes to us not from the past and not from the present, but from the future. Because God speaks of things that have not yet happened as though they have happened, and God cannot lie. So when he came to Abraham in Genesis 17.5 and said, I have made you the father of many nations, he was speaking the truth and not a prophetic truth, but a manifest truth. Because God had come to Abraham from the future, and from his perspective, Abraham was the father of many nations. In Genesis 15.8, God comes to Abraham and says, Unto thy seed have I given this land. But that didn't happen for 500 years or better. In Psalm 2.6, speaking of the coming Christ, God says, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. But that didn't happen for a thousand years. In Isaiah 53.5, the prophet, speaking as God had instructed him, said, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. But that didn't happen for 700 years to come. Now, I could give you more examples, but no more needed. You get the idea. Over and over in the course of redemptive history, God comes to his people and speaks to them of things that have not yet happened as though they have happened. And this stands as evidence that in these moments, when God visits his people and speaks to them, he comes to them not from the past and not from the present, but from the future. Now, that may strike you as an odd thing to preach about, because though it is biblical, it's difficult to imagine any practical use for that knowledge. But I'm about to give you a practical application for that knowledge right here and right now. Romans 8, 28 through 30, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, by show of hands, how many of you can truthfully testify this morning that in this moment, this time, in this place, you have been glorified? Oh, not a one of us can make that claim. I'm glad no one raised their hand. <laughs> not one of us can make that claim. Yet according to God, it has already happened. Now how can that be? That can be because God speaks of things that have not yet happened as though they have happened, and God cannot lie. Beloved, that is the basis upon which the Bible testifies to us over and over that we have been saved and that we are being saved. And it is with that understanding in view that we can rest in the knowledge that our justification is not legal fiction but a de facto reality. We have been justified, and we are being sanctified. At present, we have not yet been made actually righteous, because actual righteousness isn't the work of justification. Actual righteousness is the work of sanctification. The work of justification is imputed righteousness. Now, I know that what I've said this morning may not seem to bring us any closer to answering the question but I promised you two weeks ago I would answer the question of whether baptism justifies. Well, we've come closer to answering that question than you might think. Because in light of what I have said today, I have a question for you. Baptism is the chiefest among all sanctifiers. Why would you want it to justify? If baptism together with faith justifies us, what will sanctify us? Without sanctification, justification is legal fiction. Chiefest among all sanctifiers is baptism. Do you really want to move baptism into the justificative category? That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30 and worship services are at 10.30. We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.